just terrible. It just sounded like a big train whistle, and we were right underneath the front of it. I've, I've never seen anything like it, and I don't want to again. It's there. It just, it just stopped that morning. Just a nightmare. Just a nightmare. It was a black cloud or wind, dirt, and everything coming up over the hill. You come and you see your home, and two seconds later, it's all gone. What can you do? We lost everything that we had. My little grandson asked me what it was, and I told him I thought it sounded like a train, but I knew it wasn't. And it just hit, and that's it. Hey, Anthem! Anthem! It struck without warning. Injured victims of twisters and grieving survivors of those killed have uttered those words of anguish time and again in the wake of nature's most violent storms. It struck without warning. Weathermen don't like to admit it, but it's true. Despite efforts to warn the public before a tornado hits, statistics speak an awful truth that we have failed. It is the purpose of this television program to report the good news that tornadoes need not strike without warning again. I'm John Coleman, and this swirling antenna represents the technical breakthrough that we believe can prevent future loss of life and injury when tornadoes strike. Each year in this country, about 700 tornadoes form in strong, turbulent thunderstorms. They take random shapes from narrow rope-like swirls to tremendous tubular funnels of extraordinary size and intensity. In most cases, these violent twisters move through rural and unpopulated areas. But every so often, their paths of destruction find major population centers, and they leave scores dead and hundreds injured. The region most frequented by these storms extends from Texas to Florida and as far north as Wisconsin, Minnesota, and the Dakotas. Most major metropolitan complexes in this area have experienced devastating tornadoes. In Tornado Alley earlier this spring, a mammoth tornado tore through Wichita Falls, Texas. Dead, 45. Injured, over 400. Oklahoma City, also in Tornado Alley, has recorded 35 tornadoes during the past 90 years. Topeka, Kansas, endured this monstrous funnel in June of 1966, leveling a major portion of that city. On April 3rd and 4th, 1974, 148 tornadoes rampaged through the Midwest and Deep South, killing 315 people from Huntsville, Alabama, to Louisville, Kentucky, and Xenia, Ohio. The greatest disaster on record occurred partially in our own state. March 18, 1925, the famous Tri-State Tornado. It hugged the ground for over 350 miles, killing 689 people. That gigantic tornado passed only 175 miles from Chicago. Our Chicago area has its own history of violent tornadoes, dating back to the 1800s. This rural road represents what it may have been like in the prairie and farmland setting of the northwest side of the city in 1896. On May 25th of that year, just two days before the tragic St. Louis tornado that killed 500, a massive tornado descended upon this prairie region. It touched down near the east side of what now is O'Hare Airport, and it moved eastward towards Chicago, destroying everything in its path. The twister lifted near Pulaski Road, but not before it flattened a nearly rural area, causing about $100,000 damage in homes, barns, and trees. That area is now along Devon Avenue. A tornado of that size and intensity today could kill hundreds of people in Park Ridge, Lincolnwood, and North Chicago. Without advance warning, that figure could be in the thousands. In Chicago's early history, tornadoes were concentrated in the sparsely populated rural areas around the town. Today, the population is five times as large, and the metropolitan area 15 to 25 times larger, increasing the area that is so susceptible to a tornado strike. There's no doubt that Chicago receives its fair share of the nation's tornadoes. In fact, since 1950, 800 tornadoes have come within 125 miles of Chicago. Some of the biggest tornadoes occurred recently, such as the Leiden Township tornado in March 1976 and the Lamont tornado in June of the same year. 
These storms had the potential of becoming great killers. In the Leiden Township tornado, residents along the 25-mile path were given only nine minutes warning. But in that instance, the very nature of the tornado saved countless lives. Instead of staying on the ground, it skipped along the ground, only touching down at a few spots. The Lamont tornado struck on a beautiful Sunday afternoon. In midsummer, many were away. Others were relaxing in their yards and had plenty of time to see the storm coming and react on their own. The toll of both storms reached only four dead, 92 injured. The premier tornado in Chicago's history took place on April 21st, 1967, and is remembered by most of us as the Oak Lawn Tornado. An intense funnel hiding in the darkness as night fell cut a path of death and injury through the southwest suburb, where survivors still hold a vivid memory of the fear and helplessness. In all, 33 people died, hundreds injured, damage extensive. The facts speak quite plainly. Chicago is tornado prone. But the random occurrences, the long time intervals between these killer storms, leads to a dangerous apathy on the part of Chicagoans. In Wichita Falls, many were killed because they ignored the warning siren. Curiosity seekers actually drove to their deaths trying to get a better view of the tornado. This problem is compounded by too many warnings of unverified severe weather and tornadoes. Warnings of tornadoes covering many counties at the same time. They just to add to the public blasé reaction after severe weather situations. In a moment, I'll show you why it takes tornado warnings so long to reach you, and why they so rarely turn out to be true. Chicago's front line of defense in tornado detection is this piece of equipment, located in Marseille, 60 miles southwest of the city. This radar, used by the National Weather Service, was designed back in 1957, 22 years ago. Its radar echoes are relayed to the Chicago office of the National Weather Service, where meteorologists interpret the data and issue warnings for Chicago and Northern Illinois. I asked Ray Waldman, the meteorologist in charge of the Chicago Weather Service office, just how a tornado warning is determined and distributed. When we have the report of a sighting, we try to associate that with a severe thunderstorm on radar to determine what its movement is and so that we can accurately warn anybody that might be in its path. The supervising meteorologist right behind me ascertains whether or not a tornado warning is necessary. He then directs a man at the severe weather desk to issue that warning and he issues it using via the national warning system, the NOAA weather radio system, and the NOAA weather wire. Actual sightings and radar reports are Chicago's early warning system. Ray, does our radar actually see tornadoes? Uh, unfortunately, our present radar system doesn't allow for the positive identification of every tornado. The time element is crucial. Ray, just how long does it take to get this information to Chicagoans? Well, John, uh, it takes about two to five minutes from the time we get the warning uh, to the time that we disseminate it on our three major communication systems, which are the NOAA weather radio, the national warning system, uh, and the NOAA weather wire. And the media, TV and radio and newspapers would get it via the NOAA weather wire. And uh, I believe that that would be at least on the average another five minutes. The reality of the situation is that the majority of you get your tornado warnings from us, the television and radio stations. And it takes up to 20 minutes before that warning gets on the air. And that amount of time, a twist of the size of the one that struck Wichita Falls, could travel 20 miles on the ground. That's 20 miles of devastation before the warning reaches the public. I asked the expert on severe storm warnings, Alan Pearson, the director of the Severe Storms Forecast Center, just how good Chicago's warning system is. Chicago is a very large town, so we have to depend upon the very big stations for giving the warnings. And my experience with Chicago stations suggests that they will not interrupt their programming at any time to carry a live warning. 
After many years of tornado watches and warnings, we still seem, Alan, to be failing to serve the public need thoroughly. We seem to have a lot of false alarms, and the result seems to be apathy. What do you see at the root of this problem? Well, John, when we first started making the tornado forecast, we had almost panic. People just didn't know what to do, and they were frightened. But they've heard enough watches, and they've heard enough warnings without something happening to them personally. So basically, they're not paying much attention to us. How many false alarms are given under the present system? Nationwide, I would say they're about 8 out of 10. Is that figure appropriate for Chicago? I don't know. I think, it's, I think Chicago does a better job than that. But they're still not, they're still not batting 300. Present radar leaves a great deal be desired as to telling us not only exactly where the storm is going, but which way it's going to go into the future. We're doing about the best we can with the equipment we have right now. The facts speak for themselves. Although the meteorologists who issue our tornado warnings are doing their very best, they still can't detect tornadoes before they form. I've been involved in this tornado warning system in Chicago for 12 years, passing on hundreds of warnings most of which never turned out to be real tornadoes. To this day, I've yet to know that these warnings saved a single life. Instead, the truth is that in tornado situations, you're still pretty much on your own. It's your own eyes and ears that have been your best warning system when tornadoes approach. But that need not be the case anymore. This is a Doppler radar display. By telling us where a tornado is going to form before you can actually see it, it can solve the problem of the false warnings, save lives, prevent injuries. In a moment, we'll see it in operation. This is the Doppler radar dome at the Severe Storms Laboratory at Norman, Oklahoma. The last time I was here was in 1975 when I reported to you that Doppler research was the hope for the future. This is it, the meteorological Doppler radar. These scientists are more excited about it than you could guess. And they really do think that within a year or two, they will have significant answers from the signals it brings them this summer and next as the severe storms roll across Oklahoma. The tests that have followed have been very successful. The Doppler works. To learn just how it works, I talked with Don Burgess, the research scientist who gave the test. He has invited us into his laboratory for a demonstration. Don, we're entering an area that is fantastically complex. Looks like it's out of the 21st century. Now, how with all of this gear can you detect a tornado before it actually forms? Well, with our Doppler radar system, the signal will come into this building processed by this bank of mini computers. We have a magnetic tape unit here attached for recording the displays as they're produced. These systems process the data, they archive it, they get it in the proper format to come out on our display systems where we'll actually see the velocities. The first display that you'll notice is a black and white graphics display. It has a field of arrows each arrow is related to a velocity. We're looking for a certain pattern in velocities that will tell us where rotation occurs. Now we've taken the same kind of information and we've colorized it. These two displays that are now in front of you. The one on the left is a reflectivity display in color, much as it would appear to a television station that has a colorizer on its radar. It's, that's, that information is no different than is available today. On the right is the new addition with Doppler radar, the velocity information, colorized. We have green colors there, and they grow in intensity for higher speeds for flow that's toward the radar. We have red colors. Again, the bright red is strong flow away from the radar. Don, looking at this color display, how would this particular arrangement of colors indicate a tornado? We watch the circulation develop up in the cloud, perhaps at 20,000 feet, and with the color velocity display, we can track its descent down to cloud base, and we can see with precision where it touches the ground. Now, in 
tornado warnings then based on Doppler radar, can you narrow down the warning area and tell people on a specific street or in a specific subdivision to watch for the tornado? We can narrow it down to a particular part of a city, certainly a particular part of a metropolitan area where the threat is occurring. We combine this display information with an automated tracking routine that will tell us which way the signature, which way the storm is going, where it's likely to move in the future. And these two things together pr provide the best warning and will help us to warn only that small area that's actually in danger and not a wide area as we currently do. Part of your test, I know, was run in conjunction with the National Weather Service office in Oklahoma City. How did your tornado warning results differ from theirs during that test period? We found for tornado and tornado warnings that Doppler radar detected eight out of every 10 tornadoes with a prediction. A tornado warning was, at, we were able to issue a tornado warning before the tornado formed. With the National Weather Service radar, they only could correctly identify two out of every 10 tornadoes, and very rarely could they give a warning that would precede the touchdown of the tornado. How long before that tornado touched down and began killing or injuring people our, could you give a warning? Our average lead time before the tornado first touched the ground was 22 minutes for our warnings. For those of the National Weather Service with conventional radar and spotters, the average lead time was only one minute. That is, the tornado, at the time it touched down, that was the time it was identified. There was no lead time. You say you've had lead time that has averaged 22 minutes. Do you sometimes find greater lead time than that? Yes. For instance, this storm had a lead time of approximately one hour. Now, in other storms, particularly weaker tornadoes, the circulation forms more quickly, and perhaps the lead time is only 10 or 15 minutes. But in general, the worse the tornado is going to be, the longer lead time that we have. As a result of your testing, are you now ready to recommend that Doppler radar become operational? We generally have the knowledge, and now we have a study which proves it. All we lack uh, is the go-ahead to build these radars. Do you feel at this point that the other experts in the field of radar and tornadoes would be willing to back up your assessment that Doppler radar should become operational? I believe that other experts uh, agree and they concur with our research findings that have been published that this type of radar, Doppler radar, is superior to conventional radar and should be implemented. So next we ask the national expert Alan Pearson and Ray Waldman in Chicago if they do agree. Doppler radar is ready to go and it's ready to go right now. Do you think the Doppler radar will solve the problem of apathy? I don't think it will take very long, particularly for the larger tornadoes. In order to pay for these Doppler radars, perhaps we have to trade something off. What trade-offs can we make? Well, I hope that we don't have to trade anything off. I believe the Doppler nationwide will come to about 50 cents a person, and I think that's pretty cheap. I think it's the, the best thing that I know of on the horizon to solve the problem of issuing timely tornado warnings. And we double-checked with Waldman to make sure that he wanted a Doppler radar here and now. I'd like to see the Weather Service have a Doppler radar to protect the huge population of the Chicago metropolitan area because this gives the best promise of providing more lead time for tornado warnings. We can have an operational Doppler radar protecting the lives and well-being of the people of Chicago by next spring. The only thing stopping us now is money. And I don't feel that we should let money stop us when the lives and well-being of the people of this area are on the line. We can't wait for a disaster such as the one that occurred at Wichita Falls earlier this spring happens here. So a Doppler radar cost a million dollars. What's a million dollars compared to the lives of the people of Wichita or Oak Lawn closer to home? The National Weather Service says there's no money in its budget to buy Doppler radars till the mid-1980s. If 
the Weather Service can't provide this life-saving tool, then the city of Chicago or Cook County or the state of Illinois or a public-minded individual should underwrite this project. And maybe the congressmen who serve this region should take another look at the National Weather Service budget. Let them ask the people of Oak Lawn or Lamont how they measure the early warning of a tornado versus that million-dollar price tag. A million dollars, that is a lot of money, but it's not very much compared to the lives of these people.